<laughs> but that's not sad. I, I am just uh, ruthless power. It's just me. It's no, it's no, it's no control rooms, no committee. It's a madman in his, in his computer. Cook, cook, cook. Um... Dan, it's been too long. Jack, it's been a very long time. It's been so long. I was trying to think of when the last time we actually just recorded. Just us two. Mm. It seems like, from the viewer's perspective, it was just, what, yeah, two yeah, weeks yeah. ago. What do they know? What do they know, idiots? <laughs> it's the last week. Oh, nearly three Dan, weeks. cut that. <laughs> nearly three weeks. <laughs> nearly three weeks um, since we've done our thing. Mm -hmm. And we're back. Feels good. Um, don't think anything has changed at all in that three weeks so uh -huh. <laughs> i don't know uh, what you mean to... in our lives or in the world or I yeah mean, like... I, I don't know I don't know. any of it any yeah. of it i bought i bought some onion bulbs i bought some uh something else they are hiding in your bed as well no oh my god that's something i need to update everybody on <laughs> i gave such bad advice about potatoes if you've been following my advice for seed <laughs> potatoes my god get them out from under your bed immediately they're not supposed to be out of light they're supposed to be in light my god really they're supposed to be Here's the thing. I, okay, so, well, <laughs> well that business that I mentioned that I constantly am uh -huh, at. Uh -huh. um, Still and... not worked that one out. <laughs> I hope you have. Why, Jack? Why are you just hanging them out there all the time? <laughs> uh, don't worry about it. Um, anyway, at this business, um, a worker there told me to just keep them under your bed and as long as they're dry, they're fine because they're supposed to be out of light. Wrong. Completely wrong. Thank God I ran into somebody um, at the local allotment who set me straight. And then I looked it up and they were right. What you're supposed to do is take all your seed potatoes, um, uh, sit them up in like an egg carton or something like that. Have there's a, Supposedly on each potato, there's like a flat bit and then a round bit with more chits. Have that bit facing up and get all the sunlight you can because if you keep them out of sunlight, then you're just going to get all these like weird, white, gross, spindly things that are just constantly trying to find light. And then if you keep them in light, you get really strong, thick, green I chits. I see, so they're going to grow anyway. Exactly. And you want them to be... You want them to be strong, thick, sure. green. Sure. And they're getting there. Honestly, they're getting there. It's okay. been for quite some time. Okay. Mm. Okay. Very exciting. Uh -huh. So, oh, onions and garlic. It's funny because the garlic is just garlic. Sure, yeah. <laughs> you just, you might as well have just bought garlic bulbs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's slightly more expensive. <laughs> um, but you should... Okay. Yeah. yeah. Exciting. I thought garlic... Plant the garlic soon i don't know i thought i th maybe it's maybe it's one of these things where there are several windows i think exactly. you can plant in autumn garlic can't you? yeah yeah but maybe it's too you, it's now winter and it won't survive yeah. so maybe you have i think to it, it said it said soon. autumn or spring so okay okay that's what i'll be doing gotta get the compost situation sorted out um ah so much work to do so many things to do so many things to do things are going on um but speaking of things on the list we're checking one off right now we're back to eden medina um so we'll be getting to that shortly, as soon as I say, welcome. So I'll your statement, subject. I'm Dan. Dan, how are you? I am well. Good. <laughs> I'm very well. Good to hear it. Any uh, broad bean updates for us? They're still growing. Mm -hmm. Good. So, yeah, <laughs> they're still growing. Yeah. I think there, there are some other things growing in our garden, but um, they're all so minute that I can't tell them apart. Mm. No, that's not true. Oh my God. There are some, you know, we've got some carrots that seem to be growing, some pak choy that seem to be growing. Cool. I think the the winter salads, the lamb's lettuce, probably should, should have been planted several months before we planted it <laughs> because they're still like tiny little a shoot and two leaves kind of thing. Um, when I can imagine that you probably ought to be yeah. cropping it by now. Nah. I don't know. It's all yeah. an experiment. It's all an experiment. There are things growing. Are, so have you taken your covers off of your broad beans? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I recently I took them off accidentally too. and then forgot to put it back on. Yeah. And saw that about 10 days later in a bit of a panic. I'm like, oh, they're fine. Yeah, I think mine are doing better now. Yeah. Yeah, so now that they're not really covered. So yeah. there you go. So don't cover them up. If any of you are growing broad beans, up. perhaps only cover them until they're like an inch or two high, and then just let them go. They'll be fine. Mm -hmm. They're big lads. Mm -hmm. They'll be fine. <laughs> Unlike Jack, who can't cut with cold at all. Again, like me. <laughs> I'm the opposite of an agua dulce broad bean. I am uh, <laughs> still very cold, and that's all I'm going to say on the weather for now because... We talk about it a lot, and it's not getting any better. Uh -huh. I've been told, though, that the weather won't get better until March, and that sucks. But you can, you're can <laughs> resigned to that fate. Not really. No, okay. st I'm still angry about it. Still very angry about it. It's been okay recently. This past weekend when I was at work, it snowed, which sucked. But I will say I've come to the conclusion that working in the snow is better than working in the rain. So I had that going for me, <laughs> at least. That was okay. Um I'd like to offer thanks to Tom O'Brien for coming on the show once again. Excellent point. If Thank anybody you, hasn't listened to that episode, mm. go back and listen to it yeah, and what, after this one. Yeah, one thing we didn't mention, too, uh, go watch the live stream. It's on a U our YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel. Never even mentioned that. Go look it up on that. 
I know, you'll find it. It's called like Zoe Statements. <laughs> yeah, or don't. It's fine. It's fine. Um, you'll, if you'll... anybody came uh, to listen to the episode oh, yeah. that featured Tom and has hung around, welcome. Welcome. Stay, and thank you. Stay as long as you like. <laughs> We like to be hospitable here. Uh, take your shoes off. We can off, do though. anything for you. We can get you anything. <laughs> let us know. No pressure. Unless the thing that you want is like a really complicated Marxist text, then we're not going to do that. <laughs> or if no, we do, no. we'll split it up word by word, episode by episode. So um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. We're not going to give you what you want. <laughs> we will d- dedicate the things that we choose to do to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And at least mm. convince ourselves that that's what you want. <laughs> um. Still riding that high. That was a blast. That was yeah, very, very yeah. cool. Good fun. Good, 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 good. Fun. Our episode number one, not the intro, but episode number one, as of right now, Dan, 99 listens. Okay. It's been like that since... Should we wait? We can wait. <laughs> Should we wait? Well, it's been like that since we'll this the, morning. We'll get the so. counter out. <laughs> you know what? Actually, <laughs> should I check it live right now? Hang on. Um, that would be fun. I checked it right before we did this, though, and it was still at 99. Uh, come on, guys. Come on, guys. Step it up. I mean, one of us could just go listen to it. <laughs> you don't know. Well, I tried. I tried. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. Not recently, obviously. In the past few days. Still 99. Last week. I'll, I, le- I'll leave that window open. I started listening. <laughs> Might change by the end of the episode. We'll keep you updated. Yeah. Keep me updated, Jack. Mm. Dan and I recently had that conversation about what number per listens are we going to be happy? Like, where are we going to get to where it's just going to be like, I think we should share this. I think 100 for me. Oh, That's why I've been been reloading it. I just can't wait. Set your heights just a little bit higher than where you are at the moment. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Watch this episode never get to 100. Um, Uh Uh So, yeah. Yeah. Again, new listeners, if there are any of you out there, hello. And... Hope you enjoy this episode, our most recent episode, as of right now. Um, as we said, Eden Medina, we're back. We're finishing it up. Cybernetic Revolutionaries, chapters three, four, and five, and everything else, the conclusion, yeah, appendices, the the whatever. Book. I don't know. I, I don't think I read the appendices. <laughs> there is. Or the epilogue. One of them was, the epilogue was just kind of like, yeah. she met Stafford Beer. One yeah. thing, I looked up Stafford Beer's old cottage in Wales, uh-huh. pre-COVID, and presumably post-COVID, if that ever happens. Um, Can you visit it? You can stay there. Ah. It's 30 pounds a night to stay in his refurbished cottage. And I looked at it and there are like all these weird engravings that he's made everywhere about like, he has like little sayings carved on the beams about like, I am here. I am like, I don't know, something Sounds yoga kind of related. Yeah, yeah, it's vaguely creepy. But it's like, man, how cool would that be? It's in the middle of nowhere in Wales. It'd be sick. No beer and no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes, makes Stafford a dull boy. Yeah. Um, he's watering down his wine at the end. Yeah. I, read it, I read enough of it to learn about the watering down of the wine and the wizard's cup. Yeah, the that was cool. The goblet. Mm. That was like, no, I mean, this is a fun story, but... Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, I feel like I feel like him watering down his wine was just... Because he was like, oh, I needed, I needed to slow down drinking. <laughs> he, but tried it's to, like... he tried to abstain. He abstained for so yeah. many years and decided to opt for moderation over abstinence. But I feel like that probably just allowed him to start drinking earlier. Like, I, I, like yeah. for some reason, I was picturing her interviewing him at, like, noon. And he was, yeah, like, yeah. drinking from a wizard's cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun Same dude. amount of alcohol spread through a longer period of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Although, I mean, I got the impression he was kind of like a whiskey at lunchtime kind of person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In the 70s. So. Yeah. I mean, I think Fernando Flores basically said that he carried a flask with him, right? Yeah. And just yeah. ate chocolate and smoked cigars. Weird dude. Weird dude. Um, but yeah, this bit of the book, should we say, is the decline. Whereas, like, the first episode we did was kind of like, it's all going to be great. This is awesome. It's really, really cool. This next bit of the book, obviously, is more like, well, here's how it all fell apart, but also, like, here were Cyberson's shortcomings. Um, and yes, everything that kind of happened. I think we get some of the ascent to some extent as well. Sure. Yeah. Kind of la- last week, we kind of covered the historical and political circumstances, what was going on in Chile, mm. um, their rapid process or progress in nationalizing elements of the economy. Sure. In some place, cases faster than they would have otherwise liked. Um, and the circumstances which led Fernando Flores to contact Stafford Beer initially uh, with help answering this question, how can they more effectively manage the newly nationalised uh, industries? And we also covered some of, in our best, uh, we <laughs> oh, made God, our best yeah. effort to cover some of Stafford Beer's uh, theories. Yeah, good lord. With a little bit of focus on the viable systems model mm. um, and some more... 
a, a, a sort of broader overview of cybernetic concepts mm. and theories in general. Mm. Um, and that's generally where we left off. I want to say in like 1972. Be... Things were looking okay. Oh, I see. Early 1972. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that was what, what. Yeah, maybe it was. Was it in the early seventies? No, Bia went to Bia went to Chile in November time, autumn time, or mm. well, yeah, autumn time. Sure. <laughs> Either no, or. Sp- well, Chile in <laughs> spring, I suppose, isn't it? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> wow. Was in Chile for the spring <laughs> of uh, November seventy one, <laughs> and then yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they hatched a plan to. Build a new a new way to uh, manage the Chilean mm. economy to attempt a to far, con- far more comprehensive uh, plan than Beer had initially been invited to consult on. Mm. Um, but it was, I think, it was something that he proposed totally in, in a paper to the government. Yeah, you get you you do get the sense that he was very much like when he got there he was like oh my god i have like complete carte blanche to just do whatever i want and it just snowballed from there and snowballed from there and snowballed from there and he you know was exposed to socialist ideas at one point even medina says and i thought this was really funny that he's quoted as saying i i I have read all of the marxist literature i've read all of the marxist literature and she was like from his writings it is apparent that he did not (laughs) and also like that's an insane thing to say um but yeah he was getting more exposed to socialist ideas um and seeing wow this really vibes with what i was trying to do yeah i think it was a kind of a two-way thing he was incredibly mm. thrilled to be able to apply some of his theories to a, very sp- a specific context mm. and um certainly there were a growing number of people a small number in mm. chile who were um very excited by his propositions um and by what they were learning about um his broad sort of management cybernetic theories and what he'd been writing about how that might be applied to uh, a social context. Mm. Um, and as you say, it was a two-way street. He was becoming exposed to these new ideas and um, expanding his ideas about what a sort of a liberatory, non-bureaucratic mode of management yeah, absolutely. might be. Yeah, yeah. Increasingly influenced by yeah. socialism and I, socialists. Yeah, I had such a funny image in my head in reading about all that when he first got there of like, these like young Chileans, like, you know, Fernando Flores and all these other guys, like talking. I, I don't know this I don't know if this would have been true, but like them really trying to talk Marx with 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 uh, Stafford Beer and like it, it him kind of being like, oh my god, like I kind of have no idea what these guys are talking. <laughs> like this is a little over my head. Um but it's really fascinating because it's this this cool dichotomy where it's like he goes there, perhaps thinking that he's gonna like educate these people on like how to how to run an economy, how to run a viable system, how to do all this. But yeah, like we're saying, it was very much a learning experience for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, let me let me hit you with a quick quote just to kind of refresh us about what the whole project was about. Um, so Project Cybersyn, Eden Medina says, supported the creation of low-cost consumer goods for mass consumption. It also emphasized the use of Chilean resources in national research, development, and production activities and oriented Chilean science and technology towards meeting national needs. However... Beer argued that technology could be political in other ways. He believed that creating a technological system entailed developing a technology that could be integrated into a social and organizational context. Thus, engineering a technology also provided opportunities to engineer the social and organizational relationships that surrounded it. Beer saw Cybersyn as a way to re-engineer the relationships between white-collar technologists and blue-collar workers, workers in the state and the state-run enterprises and the national government, and to reconfigure these relationships in ways that were congruent with with Chilean socialism. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe when I said that this was a little bit, the thesis of this book kind of wound up being a little bit more of the decline of these things, that kind of encapsulates it. Because it's like, you know, for everything that Beer was trying to do, um, reality kind of seeped in a little bit. And the real kind of like material situation on the ground in Chile, obviously with like coups going off left and right, affected things. Um, uh, Cybersyn kind of wound up recreating different class hierarchies that had already existed. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more later, but it wasn't all roses, I guess. Sure, yeah. There's like a general question or a general takeaway that we could take from this book and from this episode. Uh, one that we can't necessarily answer, and I don't know whether has been how well mm. has been answered yet, which is what is the general relationship between politics and technology? How yeah. much can you um, 
how can, how much can you design a, a technical system to fully support your political aspirations or how much does it depend how much is the technology neutral and it just depends in what kind of political circumstances it is operating yeah. so as was will become apparent kind of thing like there were ways in which the team attempted to um install or instill socialist principles uh but also more broadly like uh Berean or be as cybernetic principles mm. um sort of decentralization uh sort of anti bureaucracy real time planning that also left as much autonomy for the individual production units the workers or the factories or the managers in those various factories mm. um intact as much as possible um de-emphasized sort of centralized control and left the system to be uh relatively autonomous and self-monitoring because mm. if we recall from like cybernetics in general and particularly beer cybernetics that was the whole fixation kind of thing like mm. m like an organic system how much of it can be self-regulating yeah without the need for top-down regulation kind of thing mm. um so there's yeah there's that question and sort of it comes to be the case that sort of beer is as you would expect i suppose um more or less quite fervently committed to the idea that so long as you write these uh things into the system they will play out in the way they're intended to play out to some mm. extent like mm -hmm. his focus is very much on how can we instill the politics in the technology um but there are other people who are much more like the the politics and technology are two separate realms and you sort of have to like not not have the not can read the technology as being apolitical but remember that there are other political circumstances that you have to um think about when also thinking about technology and then yeah. there are other there are other things that you say like the 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 general economic and political situation was deteriorating all yeah. the way from 73 to 73 yeah. um and it ended in a sort of a bloody way mm. um and to some extent you kind of get the impression that the Cybersyn team were insulated from that to some extent. Yeah. Partly because for the majority of its existence or the the majority of the um, the existence of the AND government, it was relatively unknown mm. to the population, to the opposition, to the media kind of thing. Mm. Um, and they had they had Allende's kind of unwavering support kind of thing. He was, he, he, it seemed like, I th my understanding is he'd made quite a commitment to stuff like uh, technology in general and uh, was really quite taken with, because um, Bia met him just one, one, one on one kind of thing uh, in the presidential palace and made this pitch for uh, creating this system. Mm, he was just like, go for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he was very, yeah, he was very, he was keen on the idea, particularly, um, I mean, he was a doctor, so he sort of understood the kind of like biological metaphors of cyber of um, cybernetics. Mm. So that he and B were already on a similar page, um, and then also, obviously, as Medina sort of set up this whole story, and as we saw last week in the early chapters of this book, there was a parallel between um, cybernetic theories and uh, Allende's desires for what he imagined democratic socialism could be in Chile or should mm. be in Chile. And there's one point that a report is given of this conversation he had where um, Allende checks whether beer is going to be used in any sort of like Soviet technology, Soviet <laughs> principles. And beer says something like, frankly, it's all rubbish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> referring to sort of like Soviet cybernetics and Soviet planning, mm. which seems to have uh, heartened Allende. Yeah. Um, because obviously he was very keen to chart another path that wasn't analogous to the soviet or the soviet model or the sort of soviet road yeah to socialism, it's communism. it's funny when you when you say that like it, the cybersyn team was very insulated from everything i think i think you're definitely right because it's funny for this whole book in which you would assume that allende would play like a major role he really he only shows up twice yeah, yeah pretty yeah. much only twice and then he dies yeah. <laughs> spoiler alert yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because there's the beginning well not the beginning but there's the beginning of the whole project where yeah he, he meets him in early 72 him. i think exactly and then also there's late 71 and is given the yeah. go ahead to do it yeah and then there's another reference to a story where beer i don't think is in the country at this point and Allende is like, can we please move all of these? This is like right when things are about to fall apart and like tanks have already started like shooting and, the, you know, they put down one coup. Um, 
where I think Allende is like, can we please put all the telex machines, move them into the presidential palace? And Beard kind of took that as like, oh, wow, he really wants to be like the center of like, you know, he really wants to keep this Cybersyn stuff where he can see it. And he's really proud of everything. But it also just kind of seemed like he just wanted to get information quicker. Sure. Yeah. It, um, but yeah. It, f- it smacks a sort of panic to some extent. Yeah, like, it does. And also like. Yeah, I don't I know. I mean, it was interesting. Yeah, it was interesting. I think there was a point in the in the summer of 73, or the, the winter of 73, uh. <laughs> uh, in Chile, um, <laughs> where Beer is there and he meets, I thought he met him again in the President of Palace. I can't remember mm. the circumstances of, of it. Um, but there's broader discussion of the sort of the deteriorating political circumstance. Mm. And uh, Eden Medina describes Beer as having quite a long conversation with um a navy officer oh, yeah. who's yeah. like uh, who was serving as um, Allende's like aide de camp, mm. um, and who was trying to negotiate with with sections of the military, or at least a navy, to yeah. support the government. And then the very evening after that conversation, that military officer was assassinated by <laughs> the right. Kind of thing. Jesus, um, which it was a dram- it was written very dramatically, but it put Beer very close to mm. um, sort of very bloody and sort of serious yeah. deterioration of the political circumstance situation e. in the sum- in the winter of 73. I like, I like how at some point coup. yeah, in the run up to the coup too he just went and stayed in that little well, beach town. Well, the successful coup. I mean, I'm not entirely sure yeah. how many like coups there were. Yeah. Mm. Well, he went, and, he went in the run up to the, the coup he just went and stayed at like some beach town where he did the Designing Freedom lectures sure, and everything. Yeah. You know, the like famous early lines about like the waves crashing against the rocks as I sit here. <laughs> I like at one point she was like, he showed up <clears throat> And even though he was trying to keep a low profile so he wouldn't be, like, killed by, like, far-right militants, he was, like, this six-foot-tall British dude with, like, a three-foot-long beard. And he also set fire to the mayor's house. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> um, but, yeah, no. So, I get the... <clears throat> we didn't really talk too much about the political situation last time. But it's this balance between, like, uh, foreign-backed, mainly American-backed, um, right-wing cells within the military... That were, you know, given Allende a difficult time, obviously. There were also, like, it. Eden Medina makes a point that, like, the petty bourgeois and, like, the just kind of, like, general, like, big bourgeoisie, obviously, like, were not really fans of what was happening, and they were making that known. But also, there were big uh, difficulties within the um, left coalition that Allende was leading. Um, Communist Party does not come out very nicely in this book. Um Perhaps for understandable reasons, perhaps not. I mean, she makes the point that, like, they weren't really very helpful when it came to trying to implement viable systems models because they, in, like, work for, like, in work, you know, in factories and stuff and in mines because they preferred just, like, this top-down hierarchical approach to economic planning. And you and I were kind of, like, mulling over whether that was just because they were, like, Soviet Union did this, we will do this. You know what I mean? So maybe that was there. Mm -hmm. But also, like... There's a certain amount of institutional inertia. I mean, perhaps mm-hmm. they occupied positions in trade union bureaucracies, in bureaucracies which are already in place to represent workers, sure, or in even in like management or worker or business structures to some extent. Yeah, um, this didn't really. And there's buy, a suggestion but... that like, well, it it, it makes sense, right? Like, it, th- this system was a direct threat to the. Uh, pre prior existing sort of management structure, organizational structure mm. of the Chilean economy. Kind of yeah. Thing. So there were a lot of material reasons why there were a lot of people who were not particularly interested <laughs> in sort of like aiding its development. Absolutely. Um, particularly when late, much later on the Cybersyn's existence becomes known to the public, particularly to a very hostile press. Yeah. Um, Even the British press, like she talks a little bit about him going back to Britain and like giving these lectures, uh, maybe it might have just been one lecture, but about like what he was doing in Chile. And even like the British left was like, "Whoa, dude, this doesn't seem to is kind of smacks of totalitarianism." Yeah, it's yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, like yeah. that's kind of not the point at all. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, I guess it to a lot of people it smacked of technocracy, and it was really easy to basically like. There's some funny cartoons in there about like Chile is being run by a computer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe there was something to that because, like, she does kind of make the point that, like, the telex machines and the computers and stuff weren't really being used exactly in the way that Beer wanted to. But I mean, obviously, it's not like Beer was trying to institute like a totalitarian dictatorship in Chile. So sure, yeah. I mean, so much of this is coloured by the the 
historical and political circumstances the world was in at the time. So mm. quite often, in quite a number of contexts in this book, um, she suggests that interpretations of things were coloured by the Cold War politics totally. that were sort of the real politics of the world at the time kind of thing. And that's why Allende so much, tried to make like so a, much as I, completely different. Exactly, yeah. So know. much as Allende decided to exist outside of that, at least in the internal organisation in mm. Chile, clearly um, the US couldn't but see it as an yeah. encroachment of socialism into South America. Um, and also, like even as you as you were saying, even those members of the British left, um, the British left that are sort of like involved in scientific academia, people mm. who should have been mm. Beer's perfect audience, yeah. were also incredibly sceptical, um, largely because so much of their politics was built around uh, uh, counterposing themselves to Soviet socialism kind of thing. Sure. And so they were just incredibly suspicious of anything that seemed to smack of sort of centralised yeah. government planning of the economy kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and some, uh, uh, yeah, and, and sort of despite Beer's best efforts, he really couldn't, like, confuse mm. them as the country, con- con- convince, con- convince them as the contrary. Or confuse them. Or confuse them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, she, she, I'll read just a short quote here because she kind of talks about Beer's naivete a little bit. Um, and... To me, I guess one of the main morals of this book is like, yes, maybe in a perfect world, if beer was to just able to go in and overlay this system and organize everything easily and it all works out perfectly and there's no external factors, no material conditions that make this difficult to do. If he was just able to put the viable systems model over the Chilean economy, maybe it all would have been okay. But there were so many other things going on that was just like, oh my God, we need to think about this. So anyway, uh, Medina says, Beer, however, recognized the real possibility of a military coup. In his letter to the editor of Science for People, he considered whether Cybersyn might be altered by a quote-unquote evil dictator, foreshadowing, and used against the workers. Since Cybersyn team members were educating the Chilean people about such risks, he argued, the people could later sabotage these efforts. Quote, maybe even the dictator himself can be undermined because information constitutes control. And if the people were to understand that they may even defeat the dictator's guns. I have found no evidence that members of the Cybersyn team were educating Chilean workers about the risks of using Cybersyn, although they might have been. More important, however, I believe, is the level of naivete displayed in Beer's response, which reveals that he did not understand the implications of military dictatorship. But then, neither did the Chilean public at that point in time. Um, and then she basically goes on to say that aspects of... Um, of kind of like the government went on to form like Dina, which was like the kind of like evil, like, you know, taking people in the middle of the night, torturing them. Like they said that there were like, you know, upwards of like 100,000 people potentially tortured, which would have been like, she said something like it might have been like 1% of the population might have been like taken by Pinochet and like either killed or tortured, which is pretty brutal. Mm. But it is, I, I don't know, that all, I think that quote just really speaks to his like, it's almost utopianism, but I think it's also just like, Maybe it was just because he was so insulated <clears throat> from everything that was going on. Mm. And like I was just like, do what do what you're gonna do. I got like more important things to worry about. If you can help me, help me. But like, I don't know. It, it, I think that that's kind of one of the themes of the book is that like maybe him and his team weren't thinking about everything that could have happened or that would affect s- implementing Cybersyn, you know. There wasn't any suggestion, just to clarify that mm. uh, I'm asking you, I'm not saying mm-hmm. um that any part of the sort of like Cybersyn apparatus was used to aid. Oh no 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 no! no, no. Uh-huh. She was just saying think, that like but... collecting information yeah, 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 in that yeah, way yeah, yeah. could totally be used, sure, and it was yeah, used yeah. by you know yeah. a totalitarian dictatorship. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because yeah. like every time there's reference made to be as like becoming more radical because of the mm-hmm. circumstances, it's always like, I mean, obviously, I mean, that was the realm into which. He lived and worked, but also that's why he came into the country to consult on these things. Yeah. But it was always like, I need to make my my system more, yeah. more like worker friendly. More populist. Or more populist yeah. to some extent. Yeah, it's funny how he realized at one point, okay, we need to get the people on board. And so he like hired um like uh what was the guy's name? Angel Pata, I think was his name. Like a oh, Chilean folk singer. Yeah, yeah, to write a song about Cybersyn, which seemed pretty cool. <laughs> I liked his idea about like every Chilean should have a little box in their home where you can do like unhappy face, mediocre face, I mean... <laughs> happy face. It's like, yeah, okay. I, I don't know about that. I was a bit frustrated by that because like um it just reminds me, I don't know whether at um at, at 
public toilets in certain <laughs> London tube state um, train stations as you go in or out. Uh, presumably, as you come out, uh-huh. it's exactly what you described. Yeah, like exactly. A, sort of like an array of buttons, sort of <laughs> happy face to sad face kind of thing, saying grading your experience. <laughs> yeah. Um, presumably, not for the same purposes of like. Uh, Sort of um, real time management of people's uh, mm. people's thoughts about yeah. how the economy was going. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. that, but as you but as you say that that was beer's fix to the question of how do we get m- more inputs from different places, kind of mm. thing. How do we branch? How do we expand these cybernetic theories or his cybernetic management approach mm. to more and more areas to give better data or to better complement the desires of. Um, the Chilean people kind of thing. Who they're ostensibly doing this for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I know that at one point she says that if... Um, she was saying that, like... But he, she, it sort of feels like he's theorizing on the fly. Yeah. When there's really sort of quite serious things going on. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Kind of yeah, absolutely. I know that she says kind of later on in the book, like, uh, like technology could have been used more to, like, further the political aims of the government. Like, she was saying that maybe um, it could have been used to, like really fully automate the if you remember from last time the algodonic system mm-hmm. which is the like anybody on any shop floor can immediately send an emergency signal to like any kind of like future management planners kind of thing that, that didn't was really the word that we couldn't happening. remember at the time yes yeah, yeah, yeah. so go back and paste that over the, that part yeah. <laughs> when we couldn't remember that <laughs> um but yeah it just gets into the role of like technological determinism mm-hmm. and all of this can you solve a country's problems like chile's purely through cybernetic systems theory mm-hmm. and technology mm-hmm answer seems to be no mm-hmm. <laughs> i don't know mm-hmm. there we go there you go the answer's no <laughs> end the book <laughs> so yeah i'm glad that we started with this kind of like the I, i'm going to reiterate like mm. um both political and economic decline mm. um and the drivers of those that political and economic decline were some ways internal and some ways external right sure. like um Allende was was elected on uh, a plurality, not a majority of votes. Um, he didn't have they didn't have a majority in the in the 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 sort of the main representative chamber. I don't know what it's mm. called in the parliament. Mm. Um, they couldn't even. There's a point where they say the popular unity didn't even have the majority of support on the main like workers uh, council that yeah. existed. Um, increasingly hostile both right but also um members of the sort of center of the political spectrum in chile that were uh, initially like lukewarm towards the popular unity government drifted toward the right um as the economic situation deteriorated and obviously there was far more money and resources mm. uh, for anti-government propaganda and anti-government actions on the right a lot of which do seem to have sort of perhaps come to them from the CIA and other I mean it seems like, like explicitly in this book the various yeah there are only there are only a few references to like the CIA mm. there's, there's there is one point where um there was a journalist who managed to get hold of some sort of cables and leaked them mm. um which they, those those letters were basically alluding to a kind of like series of sort of economic measures kind of like an economic blockade of the country mm. i think at some point she calls it like a shadow blockade yeah um, yeah, yeah but a sort of like very deliberate attempt commanded by the u.s the nixon administration in america uh and sort of facilitated by the cia to sort of like prevent lots of companies from like uh exporting to chile buying chilean mm. exports quite unfortunate when you're attempting to create quite a high-tech uh <laughs> computer system to have like all of your your inability to export from abroad massively curtailed given that they didn't have a hugely well-developed or at all well-developed like yeah uh national <laughs> technology and computer sector to some extent Mm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Internal and external pressures on the government. Mm. Um, I mean, there were things that were they were kind of like self-inflicted wounds to some extent. Like the government had come into office with this desire to or this promise to raise wages, so they did raise wages on the majority of the sort of like on a large majority of the population, but the people on the lowest incomes, which then kind of resulted in this increase in demand for consumer goods and consumer durables, which then fed into a crisis in the availability of basic and other luxury goods in the economy kind of thing which created this sort of black market economy and sort of fostered all of these sort of like 
various shortages of various kinds. Mm. Um, a situation not then helped by the the financial and the import embargoes put on mm. the government, the 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 U.S. government. Um, forced banking and ratings agencies to give Chile like the worst credit rating um so they couldn't borrow on external markets um their their foreign aid was slashed massively um it was no so, good yeah. <laughs> no good uh, i don't so, i don't think i read this quote from last time but should we just elaborate on the american pressure and because america did play it. a pretty this, big role yeah this. yeah this is the one with the nice reference to like no making God. the economy strict scream oh, no. <laughs> um so this is relatively Coke, this is Coke that one <laughs> yeah on the morning of the 15th of september 1970 okay this is 11 days after the election election of my end i mean so this is going on from the start nixon held a private breakfast meeting with kissinger that's funny i remember <laughs> from previous episodes being on our death watch um, the we'll, we'll, we'll check in a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll check in a minute. Then I'll check the listens for episode one. Uh, Pepsi Cola chairman Donald Kendall, what the fuck? <laughs> Attorney General John Mitchell and Augustine Edwards, owner of the conservative Chilean newspaper El Mercurio, and funnily enough, a Pepsi Cola bottling plant. Edwards pleaded for Nixon's assistance in keeping Allende from assuming the presidency and predicted disaster for the region if he did. A report from Senator Frank Church's Select Committee on intelligence activities, something I'd like to talk a bit more about, actually, which documented covert action in Chile from 1964 to 1973, reveals that after this meeting, Nixon met with CIA director Richard Helms, bad person, and instructed the agency to prevent Allende from taking power by arranging a military coup d'etat. Nixon did not inform the State Department, the DOD, or the U.S. ambassador in Santiago. In addition, the church committee reported... Uh, named alleged assassination plots involving foreign leaders. I would imagine that's a relatively thick uh, report. Find it. <laughs> yeah. Um, asserts that Helms left the meeting with a page of handwritten notes authorizing a budget of $10 million and more if necessary to prevent Allende's confirmation, as well as instructions to, quote unquote, make the Chilean economy scream. These instructions involved in Project Foo Belt, a covert Operation Foo Belt, come on, that resulted in the death of Chilean Army General Rene Schneider, but failed to provoke a military coup or block Allende's confirmations. Blah, 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 blah. Make an invisible economic blockade is kind of what they settled on because it seems like initially they were just like kill him or like make a coup. And then they were like, oh, it's going to be more difficult than that. So make like economic pressure. Eventually, the economic pressure kind of coincided with enough support in the military to just get Allende gone. Dan, would you like to tell us how Allende died? Because it's a very interesting story. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> or just sad. I mean, I, I, it's not covered in this book. It's not. Um, I mean, he shoots himself with a gun that was given to him by Fidel Castro. Supposedly, yes. Supposedly. That's the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very sad. Yeah. Supposedly, while they were like, the presidential palace was being shelled, you sure, know, yeah, like yeah, jets spot, were spot, dropping bombs. Yeah. He basically like told everybody to leave. He shook all their hands. Yeah, he lines them up and shakes yeah. all their hands. As Fernando Flores kind of like left and immediately got arrested, which was very sad. Um, and then he went into his office and supposedly just shot himself in the head. Twice. Somehow twice. Somehow yeah. twice, presumably because he had the AK-47 set to automatic. What are you going to do? Um, and then, yeah, supposedly Pinochet and all those guys came in and just found him dead. Yeah. Not it was a nice, very fun. It was a nice um, quote from uh, mm. from uh, Castro mm. being incredibly heated in his <laughs> criticism <laughs> but anyway, of, of, of what he'd seen in Chile. He spent quite oh, a long sure. time in Chile in 61, 62. He was there for mm. quite a long time. Um and came away quite uh well he says more he's more of a red, revolutionary more of a radical yeah than... supposedly that's what happened to shay when he was in guatemala because he saw Jacob orbans just basically like six jeeps showed up and he was like this is the coup get out of here we all need to leave and he was like that's not how you run a revolution mm -hmm. so supposedly that's what made him be like we actually need to fight for this oh troubled regions mm -hmm. all america's mm -hmm. fault mm -hmm. um Ah, God, where were we? Yeah, that's a, that's a rabbit hole. We could go to yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Let's, let's reiterate. Like, I'll make it clear that this book really doesn't cover that history. Yeah, uh, intentionally so. Right? Mm -hmm. It's 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 brief. It's something else. Um, and that, I haven't done very much researching into this history, so I only mm -hmm. have what's sort of covered in this book plus my sort of vague understanding of what mm -hmm. happened. So yeah, suffice to say, um, 
here's a very complicated story yeah in this context but also um a very sad story that's played out in a whole number of contexts all across a region across a broad swath of the world yeah uh, over a, a prolonged period all at the behest of just like inbred syphilitic dudes who own soda companies yeah. you know what yeah, i mean yeah, yeah, just yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. ah <laughs> So yeah, so so um, much bigger story. We're not covering mm. it now. Love to cover it more in the future. We'll cover it later. We'll cover it more. <laughs> we'll get there. That's just my broad disclaimer. If we're if we're missing something out, and you know something really vital that we're missing out, um, cut us some slack. Let us know Send in the us comments. An email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when we read the book, yes. we'll talk about this much more. Yeah, yeah, I'll get on with that. Um, should I hit you with just she at the end of it? She just goes one, two, three, and four. These were the points of the book. And um, we can just kind of like go over what those were because it kind of, she doesn't really, until the end of the book, when she says that, you kind of go, oh, that was the point of the book. You uh -huh, know what I mean? Uh -huh, so uh -huh. she says that. I still like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. I still like to go over, might just give a broad, mm. what was Cybersyn spent, how was it meant Hit to operate kind of thing. Um, so, as I was saying before, Beer ends up proposing a much more complicated system than he was initially asked to consult on. Mm. Um, it ends up. Basically, he wants to build a kind of like real-time communication network for the um, transmission of information about the state of the economy, um, both from the lowest levels up to sort of like a sort of central command center, um, and also for the sort of like um, flow of sort of information and commands to some extent from said command center down to the lowest levels of the economy. Um, it's, a fun, it's quite a fun quote in the book. Maybe it's not a quote. Um, Eden Medina just said something like, how do you build a computer network when you only have one mainframe computer? <laughs> because like there really weren't that many computers they had access to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the piece of technology they hit upon is the Telex machine, which mm. is some kind of like, it's a it's a machine which connects to um, the phone network and sends text based information, right? And then they discover that one of the technology institute for some reason has bought four hundred of these machines and they're just sitting in a warehouse somewhere. Mm. Um, so it means that they're able to start attempting to construct this network. Um, so one aspect of what becomes Project Cybersyn is this uh, telex network that they call. Cybernet. Mm. I, I did like at one point how Stafford Beer says that like one of the most emotional times of his whole like experience in Chile was walking into the room with all the telex machines and they're just going and he's like information <laughs> he does love him some information <laughs> yeah, tell you what um, but then there's sort of generally the question of what do you do with this information how do you process it what's the point, uh, what's the point? Yeah. Right. so they have they, so they then sort of like they develop or attempt to develop, and these are, these are the two bits of the, the prog project which sort of seemingly are, are least successful or come under a lot of strain and uh, s never really fully um, meet their uh, mandate, as mm. it were. Um, but they want to develop a, a piece of uh, a software to analyse the data that's coming in in real time to sort of process it and identify problems that appear seem to be developing in production or in the economy in general um so yeah this this project comes to be called project cyber stride <laughs> um and it's it's seemingly based on a principle whereby um because they because they don't want to be like waiting for because they don't really have enough information um and they don't they don't want to spend the time gathering the information to then um uh, put it back out again because they want it to um, be in real time, as it mm, were. Mm. They use a, a very particular and novel, I suppose, type of uh, data analysis, which is intended to kind of like uh, use probability to work out what is normal and what is not so that they can fill in gaps in their data set, as it were. Mm. Um, Basically, the intention is to have a way of analysing the economic data that's coming in and work out what is abnormal and what is not um, normal. Mm. What is abnormal and what is normal, <laughs> rather. Um, and one of the things that they say about this sort of this way of analysing data is that is that they intend for it not to accumulate, 
but they really want to jettison any data. Anything that comes back as normal, they're like, right, we don't want anything to do with it kind of thing. Yeah. And we're going to get rid of all that straight away. Mm -hmm. We're really only going to fixate on the abnormal. So we're not in the process of like collecting mass amounts of data and analyzing it um, for on no a sort of grand scale kind of thing yeah. for no reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole idea is that if something is working on its own fine, don't meddle with it kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and even then, obviously, I think to some extent we covered it last week, but even then when you get this signal of, hey, there's something wrong in this arm of production or whatever, it's not like automatically start sending commands down, freaking out, like mm. alarm, alarm bells sing, ringing mm. and everything, but like get in contact, work out what's going wrong, give them an opportunity to correct it at that particular level, yeah. work out sort of like whether there are other ways to go wrong kind of the things going wrong and the ways to correct it kind of thing. yeah it also um, seems like that would be i would assume that would just be like uh comparable to like systems four and five and that that another main point of it was just like what are the resources that you need to fix this here we can give them to you sure yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. then if it all goes wrong then they're just okay let the big boys take over yeah, yeah, yeah. and so then yeah it's, as you say like the system knows what resources are where mm. um or can sort of say hey there are these things here if you need them kind of thing um so it's more like a lending a hand rather than a sort of like a big brother kind big of thing, brother yeah. watching yeah. all the time kind of yeah. thing and then, yeah, the the other wing of the the project which was really seemed to be the most difficult was um uh <laughs> i'm trying i'm trying to remember what the acronym was chico? it was chinko yeah. Ch no 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 chico chico chico, chico. chico yeah Chico. Anyway, <laughs> I think it stands for like Chilean Economic uh, Coordination or something mm. like that. And basically they want to build a model of the entire economy mm. so that they can then um, basically have this general overview, predict particular trends, so to see whether things are trending in particular directions, um, but also fiddle with the dials to some extent to work out what certain inputs or outputs would result in over a longer period of time kind of mm. thing so they wanted to have a economic model that would allow them to do long-term planning mm. but again they didn't want that model to be uh, of a soviet kind or of a general a, a more broader general economic model in kind which was based on very historic data so uh, generally economic models were made based on like two or three or four year old data, which isn't particularly useful when you want to be making real time interventions in the economy. <laughs> so again, they wanted to sort of like try and develop this uh, piece way of economic modeling, uh, which was again was very novel in that it was sort of like, um, where they describe it as structural, I think. And the desire again was not to accumulate lots a huge amount of data but rather to find the data points that were really essential kind of mm -hmm. thing um so they were engaged in this really sort of like quite protracted and quite very detailed analysis of the chilean economy right. and it seemed like the people involved in that were almost like quite thrilled to be engaged in all these new fields and realms that they'd Absolutely, never really yeah. been involved in before and they sort of like took it really to really quite um How exciting extreme depths to some extent yeah, and there I think we see the main difference in like how Cyberson was portrayed by the British media and I guess just by the world media and what it was actually doing. It's like where where there were management structures, what you're saying is absolutely right. They were for future planning and they were for keeping everything on course. They weren't for planning the entire economy. Mm -hmm. Like the the modeled economy that they created wasn't so that they could like you know, have a hundred thousand bureaucrats moving little chess pieces of us, like a, you know, like little like Doctor Strange love as like war room. Mm -hmm. Like the point was to let everything work as it's going to work and only correct when you yeah, need to. Yeah, how can we make the further, very sort of clinical interventions if needs be, kind and of hopefully push towards socialism yeah, eventually, yeah, yeah, yeah. full on yeah, socialism. Yeah. But the, I mean, the real problem with that whole effort was one: they didn't have sufficiently uh, detailed data. Mm. And one of the main causes of that fact was that things had changed so very radically when AND came into office up until 73 that they really couldn't base, they couldn't take seriously or have it be, um, they, they couldn't have analysis of the, gov the, of the economy from the 60s be considered to be relevant for the economy in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, particularly with all the chaos that was being wrought by uh, this sort of shadow blockade, as it were, kind of thing. Like, mm. um, There's a point where Eden Meaning says, like, how could you model huh. 
covert CIA or yeah. American like interventions in the economy into your economic modeling. It's just an impossible task. Jesus. Kind of um, so a a um, a very bold aspiration and one which they um, did far more and better at than anybody would have expected. Absolutely, and especially given and, their like, resources. It took on a new piece of like. Um, uh, coding method that nobody in Ch not very many people in the world use, but nobody in Chile knew it at all. Yeah, and they sent somebody to London to sort of train up in this method, and then he came back and sort of like mm. taught the rest of them to do it, kind of thing. Mm. Um, so it was this really impressive enterprise of like people really inspired by vision and sort of like committing a huge amount of time and energy yeah. into really like becoming experts in fields that they didn't know anything about before kind of thing. Yeah. There are so many bits of this book where like you've got this team working on this thing and they're, they're depicted as being so impassioned mm -hmm. and, uh, and sort of committed and sort of like thrilled to be, uh, yeah. engaging with lots of new ideas kind of thing. It's really yeah. She exciting. basically, it's cool. Cause she makes a point where she was like, you know, you she kind of goes into a little bit of like the like big wheel of history versus like you know historical actors kind of thing where she says that like given these very specific circumstances in chile you wouldn't have had a government like i days that would have let someone like fernando flores who was just like kind of a nerd and was like so fascinated with cybernetics to reach out to stafford beer and then he wouldn't have come there and they wouldn't have done all of this yeah, it's really yeah. interesting yeah, yeah right everybody did seem really mm. stoked i mean how exciting it was such a cool mixture of like utopianism but also like necessity yeah. things had to happen like this because they had to happen like that there was no other way mm -hmm. you know they had technological uh uh barriers in their way so you know so they used the telex machines they had political barriers in their way so it always had to be adapted um yeah just yeah, such yeah, a yeah. cool story yeah, yeah you yeah. know what i mean and one, of, one of the things when this when this whole project comes to light in in 73 one of the one of the reactions some people have is just total disbelief that mm they could even manage it kind of thing. Yeah. Like, nobody believed that Chile had the the resources or the capability to engage in such just a bold mm. project. And most people thought that it was just fiction kind of thing. Yeah. Um, well I mean even setting it up so it was it's it was so it, dynamic. It was never a functional reality, but it certainly wasn't fictitious. Yeah, exactly. I mean like even setting it up, it had to be dynamic. And I mean like obviously being dynamic is one of like the main ideas behind viable systems model behind Stafford Beer's ideas, but it's like you know, Stafford Beer showed up and was like, here's what I want to do and they're like, we can't do that. And he's like, okay, I'll change my ideas just <laughs> yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, We've only got one computer. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we can only use it at night. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little hamster running on a wheel. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. So, and the final sort of arm of this project, the sort of fourth arm of this project, is the command center. What is mm. called? Isn't it? So, uh, isn't it just? Wasn't it control called? room? Control room. Yeah. It's the control room. But what, didn't it have a name? I don't think so. I think it was just control room. Hmm. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is which is if you've ever i mean it's on the cover of this book mm. if you google like project cybersyn like it's awesome that's what you're going to see yeah um it's a depiction of this control room uh, it's very it's very sci-fi although they they say that they weren't particularly inspired uh -huh. by um or they they didn't draw inspiration from like stanley kubrick's 2001 or yeah uh, the bridge of the enterprise um but uh it certainly looks similar yeah it certainly looks similar um, yeah. And that's one of the bits of this book which Medina is most excited about to some extent, and one that in a lot of ways, like, Beer also seems to be putting quite a lot of his energies into in terms of, like, mm. um, ways in which you instill uh, politics into technology kind of thing. And even just, like, maximum workflow. Like, what angle should the projector yeah. be at so you don't strain your neck? <laughs> It's funny though that there was a bit about it, and she's right to make a point about it. How beer was like also kind of weirdly influenced by like prejudices of his day designing yeah, the control yeah. room because there was one thing where they were like, "There shall be no typewriters in the control room because that is women's work." <laughs> it's just like, wait a minute, hang on, beer. Well, that was, I think that was a bit. No, I think that was an accidental one, right? Like the desire to not have typewriters be in there mm -hmm. was that. I think that it was like they really wanted to have. Uh, workers be able to understand to be able to be in the control room and yeah. operate it to some extent mm. and i think it was just a, like here is a mediating factor which will alienate shop floor workers from mm. this space or an ability to engage with the activity that's meant to be going on in this space mm. the prejudice was 
like how that basically excluded yeah women because like that was yeah, it, that it was a very sort of work. gendered um, yeah. uh, skill yeah like typists were mostly women and like they were basically mm. just excluding women from that space mm. um i mean it i mean the, the more sort of like problematic aspect was his he, he wanted it to have he described it as wanting he wanted it to have a sort of like gentleman's club vibe, yeah. Yeah. like or like a like a private club kind of it vibe. does seem like a mixture of that and the bridge of the enterprise yeah, it's got yeah. some leather it's got some like it's like mm. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um and i mean in, in stafford beard's head right that was how do you um, facilitate open communication between the people in that room. How do you uh, get away from traditional management structures and have uh, it be a more sort of like collegiate, collective mm. um, management space kind of thing where all the people that were in that control room were sort of co-equal in the decision-making process kind of thing. Mm. Um there was a point in time when the plans for the control room featured a bar. <laughs> yes. Uh, which had to be gotten rid of at a certain point when ah. they realised they didn't really have the space for it. Um. <laughs> that was just that was just him having an excuse to order like five bottles of whiskey or something mm, like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How can we <laughs> get some whiskey on it's the... Like, no, 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 no. It's for the control room. Time. <laughs> you get dime, rather. Yeah. Than, um, um, but also there's like the... Um, like the, the design of the... There were certain aspects of the design of the chairs, right? So that at one mm. point there was going to be um, one, one station that was responsible for changing the data that was displayed on the various screens in the room. Um, and one of the compromises, I don't think this came from Beer, this came from one of the designers of the control room, was to put the controls in the arms of every chair in the room so everybody could have the responsibility for, um, for changing the data kind of thing. Uh, but also... Um, they were quite like big, brightly coloured buttons, which were meant to sort of like facilitate um, almost quite a sort of aggressive approach to um, sort of interacting with the machine and changing the data. There's one point when Bia sort of like wants to instill a kind of like uh, hitting of the machines, the buttons <laughs> kind of thing quite vigorously as, as, an abil as a way to sort of like facilitate the communication to some extent. Or, or at least to allow people to demonstrate their commitment to certain things. Um, forgetting, of course, that, like, to some extent, um, or as, as Medina paints it, to some extent that's a very kind of, like, macho, masculine form of communication that is being written into the functioning of this room, right? So mm. here is Beer trying to construct a space which is um, open to all forms of communication one which can be related to by your shop floor workers as well as sort of like managers and sort of government bureaucrats. Um, but because of, as you say, because of sort of the prejudice of his time, he is sort of like making it accidentally or maybe intentionally a very sort of gendered space mm. uh, where um, potentially men would feel much more mm -mm. at home or... Um, or just the work sets that men generally inquired, yeah, 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 yeah. acquired in that time mm -hmm. would be more suited to the work that was being done there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, also we should get into there's a bit of a class element too going on with like the interveners, which were these people that were supposed to kind of be like a bit of a system too, going around checking on factory floors and stuff like that. And also like the control room people, right? Sure. Because Beer's whole point was that like he wanted to get blue collar, quote unquote, like workers in the control room, helping out with management, so there wasn't just these white collar workers. That like you weren't just transplanting the bureaucracy onto these systems and yeah. still having the blue collar workers be everywhere. But what wound up happening was these class prejudices obviously still existed. They didn't go anywhere. So like when a guy from a factory showed up to be like, "Hi, I'm going to help with management," all the other people were like, "Oh my god, mm -hmm. we got to deal with this guy now. He has no idea what he's talking about." Mm -hmm. So that was like a big source of tensions. Um, yeah, kind of again, just perhaps not really reading the political situation. Um, or just like the realistic social relations, you sure. know, perhaps a little bit too utopian about it. But I mean, again, in a perfect world, maybe if you did just, like I said, overlay this model on things, it would have been fine. But again, I suppose we're just not really thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, There's a moment when she's talking about the difficulty that the interventors or whoever, or maybe it was people who were um, attempting to collect economic data, mm -hmm. where they were going to the factories and trying to convince um, the managers to 
attempt to begin sort of transferring data to the command center through the telex machines or at least to sort of give over economic uh data from their plants and what have you mm. um and one of the things she says happened or they discovered was that it's much they were much better off um painting this project as a sort of like new form of technocratic management mm. and they divorced from it um any discussion of the politics at all mm. because like if you can make it if, if you can make it seem like it's uh, just another wing of management something which the the existing management structure can understand then they're much more likely to cooperate with it than if you say here is this thing we're attempting to empower sort of like the shop floor workers and uh, give them the ability to circumvent traditional management structures um and oh yeah it's like an explicitly socialist thing um you get a lot less uptake or a lot less willingness to cooperate kind of thing mm -hmm. so again there was like as you, an accidental um or a concession to circumstances which did sort of removed some of the politics from um the the implementation of the system and sort of like lent it to become what it was intended not to be which was like at least something that was seemingly uh technocratic yeah and bureaucratic yeah yeah it's all very interesting just them trying to balance that view of it all just being technocratic and like and it's a lot of extents it kind of did wind up being a little bit technocratic sort of by necessity sort of by maybe just kind of like some mistakes that were made along the way um it's a bummer story mm -hmm. doesn't have a very happy ending mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah i suppose it just for the last bit of the story once um and it's assassinated Guy named Pinochet comes in. Pinochet's very bad. He's very right wing, but he was very much like did basically exactly what the like quote unquote like Chicago boys told him to do right, and that was like Milton Friedman's kind of ilk. Um, and they basically uh, instituted what a lot of folks would call neoliberalism pretty brutally on the country, which was just like freezing wages, stopping public spending, um, all sorts of you know complete like immediately reprivatizing everything that I had nationalized. Um, and that went on for quite some time. Um, yeah, sort of the world's first avowed neoliberal state, to the extent mm. whether that piece of terminology existed at the time, like the first state mm. to yeah. um, organize its economy along sort of neoliberal principles. Yeah. Sort of test case, a world test case in neoliberalism. How, how do you look at, though, what happened there? I guess because you're just some schmuck who owns, uh, fuck, you know, like Pepsi-Cola bottling plant. But it's like, how do you look at what happened there and go, we should do that to every country? Yeah, yeah. It's like all of the thousands of people Shot that literally had to win. be murdered. <laughs> yeah, it's like, Jesus. Um, brutal. Mm. So, so interesting, though. I mean, like, I guess maybe do you want to talk about maybe why this has had such a resurgence in the left. Because it's like, I know that, like, we were talking in the Tom episode about, like, Wow, new ideas about economic planning. How cool. Oh, my God, this was 1970. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's funny because it's like generally when you talk about economic planning, um, you talk about the Soviet Union. And, and it's hard not to because it's an extremely large economy that was planned, right? Um, all of the caveats that go along with that. But, I mean, like, I guess one of the reasons socialists now find this so fascinating, even though it didn't really wind up going anywhere after a couple of years, um, is just because it is a relatively fresh approach. I mean, like, you know, Allende, when he came to power, talking about, like, his third way and not wanting to be aligned with, really, either country. Um, it is It is just maybe just interesting to see how it could have been done. I mean, who's to say about, like, where this would have gone had there not been that pressure on Allende? Um, but, but, yeah, I don't know. I guess, I guess it is just because it's like, oh, my God, this, you know, nearly worked and it was nearly humanitarian and it was nearly, you know, involved liberty just as much as you know, hard-headed, like, where do we want our economy to go, to go, mm -hmm. centralized, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's difficult because, like, although, um, obviously, the AN Day government fell, mm -hmm. um, and certainly, CyberSyn, in a lot of ways, was sabotaged by the economic circumstances of the day, um, and also sort of the sort of te technological position that they were in, there's an extent to which it's, it feels to me anyway, like it was only functioning well when it was like a committed number of sort of like yeah. 
tech nerds with <laughs> with a sort of carte blanche from Allende to mm. pursue this project kind of thing. And as we were sort of saying, like traditional management structures, tr- traditional philosophies were creeping in in quite a number of places. Mm. Now, whether that was purely due to um, the economic conditions they were operating under or whether it's a more broad-based problem of just it's very difficult to... You ca- you can't just... You can't simply ch- have a re- introduce a revolutionary piece of technology and hope for it to have, like, broad based and sweeping effects on like, yeah. the the social structure of a country kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, that, as we learned from Alan Meeson's Wood episodes, is a little deterministic. Quite, quite. A little quite, quite. technologically deterministic just yeah. to go in there and lay this all over and it'll all work out. Yeah. Technology, baby. Yeah. So I suppose if um, if there was, if there were um, a much more broad-based social revolution going on at the same time, if there were a uh, general desire for a reorganization of this sort, mm. then certainly it would be a welcome model to have at hand to sure. consider working from. Certainly it seems like a lot of those social relations that remained intact throughout A&A's entire presidency obviously did not help because, I mean, um, it was funny. I was, I was just looking at some photos of like Chile during this time and there was a photo of like a pretty large protest of like middle class men and women mm-hmm. um, protesting against Allende. Sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, it does just lead me back to that idea about like prior to introducing this technology, prior to improving the land, you know, to make a reference to um, to the Mason's Wood, the social relations really, you know, hadn't been altered at all. It was just laying this technology over uh, the same relations, the same, you know, I mean, like, literally the same people, right? So it's like all of these prejudices, all of these class hierarchies, they're all still there. And mm-hmm. while they were all acknowledged, and at one point Medina does say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Stafford Beer was familiar and had read all of the Marxist texts, <laughs> which I thought was awesome. And she's kind of like, okay, buddy, sure. Um, didn't seem like that understanding was fully there. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess the reason that we still find it so fascinating is because it was something that nearly worked, right? And we can predict into the future as much as we want about, like, it could have worked, it could have happened, this could have been, like, the best way of organizing an economy, but sure. you know, who's to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I mean, as socialists... Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to say... Uh-oh. I was about to say, like... I was meant to make a very declarative. We are in favour of X. Oh, but cool! I would like to say this is my little like uh, mm. reeling back a little bit. Then it's on his soapbox. <laughs> that um, what we're interested in is instituting collective and social ownership, sure. as opposed to private ownership, sure. of the productive apparatuses of our economy. Excellent. I mean, if that is our aspiration. We do need to find some way mm. of managing said social and productive apparatuses. Mm. Um, now, I yeah, I've had a general worry throughout this whole thing, which is that to some extent, like, um, how much is it a a system? No matter how no matter how um, high minded, how democratic and anti bureaucratic the philosophy of the system that you're putting in place. If you're just, as you say, sort of overlaying it, um, you're really not, um, you're not really instituting worker control. It's not the workers instituting yeah. control of their workplaces kind of thing. They're, they're not, it, it, it's, it's the government being like, here have all these new powers, sort of creating a, um, an alternate and in a lot of ways like competing power structure to some extent and hoping that one will just simply win out over the other mm. um now really what you want from a socialist revolution i suppose is a a movement from below in the workplaces a desire to take over workplaces that could run in tandem with a government that was sort of trying to work out the best ways to sort of facilitate and coordinate that control mm. and to some extent we started last week by saying that 
uh, there were workplaces that would be nationalized because the workers were nationalizing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there are stories in this when in 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 seventy two there is a um, what's called a strike organized by basically organized by the bourgeoisie a truck driver strike. Mm. Um, with help from the CIA. With help from the CIA. <laughs> There's a point where she says it's a display of bourgeois power kind of thing. Mm. Like to to attach the word strike, I don't know how yeah. it's a kind of a loose connection kind of thing. Um there are a lot of places in which like this strike is functionally broken by workers sort of like coordinating and self organizing themselves by forcing their way back into factories that their bosses have closed and then operating them again with some government oversight that was a was enabled by the sort of like fledgling cyber sin mm. network that was in place mm. um so there are certainly places in the story where workers are very active participants in um the revolutionary process in air quotes kind of thing um so i don't mean to suggest in some way that this was entirely um centralized activity foisted upon an entirely unwilling population of workers kind of thing mm. but that said uh cl clearly it doesn't seem to have had the um the level of uptake that was designed yeah exactly i mean a lot of uh i feel feel like since this kind of resurgence of interest in in this whole story um the left line has always kind of been like a relatively stalinist one which was just like that didn't work they screwed up they didn't go all the way and it wasn't interested in starting a class war. He wasn't interested in starting a civil war. He wasn't brutal enough, so it just failed, you know? Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, that's starting to change, obviously, because people are, like, taking a closer look at the story and seeing what actually happened. Um, but, I mean, I guess my point is that, like, a lot of the blame is put on Allende for not really going far enough and not really, like, organizing to stop these, like, coups that were definitely going to happen. Um but I mean, like, it's interesting, like, you'd have to balance that out with what you're saying, which is like, um, you know, workers organizing themselves and taking power into their own hands and really making system one, like, you know, the main part of all of this. Because, like, for all of Beer's diagrams of, like, the workers at the center of everything, the worker is, like, what we're doing this all for. Um, for a variety of reasons, that isn't really what wound up happening. Mm -hmm. um, and the story of this is mainly the story of, like, the control room and the story of systems four and five and, like, a little bit about, like, the algenomic system and all of that. So, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I mean, it is a story that could have ended much better, obviously. Um, and these are ideas that we should certainly be taking a cl much closer look at because it's absolutely fascinating and mm -hmm. could certainly be used. Um, but I mean, you know, you also have to find your critiques with it. You know, holding beer up as, like, someone whose ideas were, like, perfect uh, isn't really going to help. Um, I, I, I will say on that point, I love the bit that Ian Medina says about like, there was a gotcha moment in the British tabloids where they were like, so you call yourself a socialist, huh? And he was like, yes. And they're like, but you drive a Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> Checkmate liberal. <laughs> I loved that. Um, mm. Yeah. I don't know. I'm thinking of reading this quote from Castro. Castro? Hit yeah. us with it. I remember this one. Because mm. it seems broadly relevant. And also it's a bit firebrandy. Oh, uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit it's a it. tasty one. It's a tasty oh, one. <laughs> all decadent social systems have defended themselves with tremendous violence throughout history. No social system has ever resigned itself to disappearing of its own free will. I will return to Cuba more of a revolutionary when I came here, here being Chile. I will return to Cuba more of a radical than when I came here. I will return to Cuba more of an extremist than when I came here. Um, I'd like to fix it on that. I think the, the first portion of that is what's really interesting, which I'm sort of was the reason why I wanted to quote it because it does run parallel to what we were saying. Like the idea is you you put this other system in place, and the other one is going to disappear into the background somehow. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's broadly what they were what Castro was saying they were broadly doing it as a, across the entirety of Chilean society to some extent, but it also has a more specific application to cyber sin to some extent where it's like um, you hope to be able to put into place something that can compete with the existing structure but um, those existing you, structures you, you, yeah, those existing structure, they're, hard to get rid tenacious, of they're tenacious aren't they they're <laughs> goddamn tenacious that, yeah that's, that's a brutal quote mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. brutal and I think I, I'd like to maybe a little bit of like uh, reeling back again like I don't know the full extent of what was going on. Where? So you can in, in Chile, Chile okay. so you can make a broad criticism. Well, clearly, 
clearly <laughs> they didn't organise enough to stop the coup. Sure. Because if they had have done, then the coup wouldn't have happened. You make um, a good point. But I don't want to say to 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 fully endorse a full on scathing attack on this uh, attempt at a sort of democratic revolutionary process. Mm. Um, well, for all of the thousands of people who died under Pinochet, who's yeah. to say how many would have died under yeah. civil war? Yeah, 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 so. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to fault the guy for not wanting to do that, mm -hmm. for not wanting to drag his country into a civil war. Mm -hmm. um, but it's worth thinking about. Yeesh. It's worth thinking about. <laughs> it's worth considering, perhaps. Um, yeah, wild. Great mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. Great characters. Mm -hmm. Read the book just because it's a great story. Uh, Eden Medina writes it very, very well. Um, and yeah, yeah. Hopefully yeah. we'll be reading some actual Stafford Beer beer here in a, soon. Maybe not soon, but eventually. <laughs> One of these days. <laughs> it's hard to, hard to get those books. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we'll see. Yeah. Um, get them out of the library, maybe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, yeah, I don't know. And that's that quote's really got me joined to read something about Cuba as well. Uh -huh. um, yeah, woof. That, that quote is brutal. I'll say it again. Um, anything else? On um, Eden Medina's Chile? Or not Eden Medina's Chile. Yeah, I don't well, know. Perhaps. I think we've covered it quite well. There's, mm. so much, there's so much stuff that we haven't talked about. So sure. that's my, us my usual sort of addendum. Point. The caveat there caveat. is read the book for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always. <laughs> yeah. Always. Yeah. But after we've read after, it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well after. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. It's It's got me jonesing for some chocolate. And for some revolution, baby. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Chocolate, whiskey, and revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah and cigars. Um, I'm surprised Stafford Beer didn't put any, like, uh, uh, like ashtrays. Or, yeah, he didn't design the cups. He didn't design the chairs, though, did he? So. He did not. Yeah, sadly. He was like, where am I supposed to put this? It was the Germans. I mean, yeah. Yeah, oh my God, that's a whole part we didn't talk about. The old school and everything. Yeah. Um, all fascinating. I just because I want to talk about it really briefly. She brings up this uh, design school in Germany called the, the came to be known as the Ulm School, which was a bunch of German designers who were like thinking about ways to design things that were not only like Bauhaus, which was a school of design that was like utilitarian but also like cool looking. Um, they were like utilitarian, but also what about the social consideration of designing things? So one of the examples she uses is like this very cool, easy to create record player that looked very neat and it was very cheap to produce worked well you can give it to everybody um i thought that was neat yeah the people that were responsible for designing the control center commands well, what was wrong with it? the center control room the <laughs> people that were responsible for designing the control room were a, a branch of the sort of like technology institute um they had a branch of their government of the sort of government apparatus responsible for design mm. uh, and yeah as jack is saying they designed a whole series of like um cheap consumer durables in an effort to substitute for the sort of reduced access to uh, commodities like that that they had because of the shadow embargo yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, Ops Room is the, its official name. Operations probably. Room, yeah, and I've said it wrong every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you listen to the end, that's your Easter egg, because you now you know what it's actually called. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I, this is this is this has been something that's been really exciting to read. Um, I'm glad we did because fresh ideas. I'm not going to say new ideas, but I'll say fresh, fresh. ideas. Yeah. And we'll be talking about this stuff more in the future. But um, it needs to be said, uh, something resembling a planned economy is going to be necessary if we'd mm -hmm. like to avoid any of the million c catastrophes that happen every day um, under a system of privatization. Um, and the ones that will be potentially like world catastrophe apocalyptic that will be coming in the future. So on that note, or present, any presently happening apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The, Notwithstanding, the <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's why we've been reading all this stuff because it is necessary. Fun times, good stuff. He's holding S his finger up. <laughs> Star Point Trek. Point of order. Point of order. S Point of order. Star Trek uh, Next Generation episode recommendation of the week. Best of both worlds, part one and two. I know that that's like a classic. Everybody says the best episodes of all time. Kind of always disagreed with that, Dan. Uh -huh. But I will say, because I was kind of like, I don't really care about Picard becoming a Borg. Um, oh, is that the one where he becomes a Borg? Locutus. What's it called? 
best of both worlds. Best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see, I see. This is what I was getting at in the in the <laughs> intro in our intro episode. <laughs> Oh. Uh, when I, in our intro episode, when I was complaining about the Borg's need to have like, ah, yes. autonomous yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, leaders. It's just you're a Stalinist. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I do it's coming out. Anarchist. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Um, but I will say, I never liked it because I always just assume best of both worlds that refers to, you know, Picard, Star Trek officer, and then going to becoming a Borg. And it's supposed to be like the best of both worlds of this like fully automated society versus this utopian idea. That is not what it is. I heard someone explain it as a Riker episode. And that made a lot more sense. And I really like the episodes a lot more because it's a Riker episode because, you know, it starts off with him. Like they're like, dude, leave the enterprise, get your own ship. You can be a captain whenever you want. And he's like, Oh, but I like really like the enterprise. So at the end of the first episode, spoiler, when Picard's, you know, off the ship because he's a Borg and, uh, Worf's like, can we just blow up the ship now, please? Even though we have to kill Picard. At that point, Riker is the captain, and so he has the best of both worlds. And so at the end of the first episode, when he says fire, and is like, just blow it all up, that's what it is. He has the best of both worlds because he's still on the Enterprise, and he has this dream of, you know, being the number one, or not being the number one, I guess, you know, being the captain. Um, and he's got a boat. And so it's all about his struggle. It's not really about Picard. I like that. That's cool. Uh-huh. I'm going to go back and watch it. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. go back and watch it. I watched the Deep Space Nine episode a few weeks ago, which is not... Um, a particularly important one in the development of the story of Deep Space Nine, but it's fun. I enjoyed it. Mm. It's called You Are Cordially Invited. Uh. It's the one where Dax and Worf get married. Uh. And I've watched it a million times before and I'd forgotten that I'd watched it a lot. So <laughs> really quite enjoyably familiar. But also like funny and nice and mm. nice, 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 nice. It, um, it demonstrates in a lot of ways how Deep Space Nine has a lot of... D- d- does sort of like character interaction and character development mm. in a way that is superior to next generation to some extent mm, yeah um, absolutely i also re- would like to make a recommendation oh. um this is it's a silly one <laughs> this is gonna be a damn movie <laughs> um larry king died larry king did die yeah and i don't really know anything about larry king but i always enjoyed i quite i feel like i quite like him and i All enjoyed right. the interviews of his that i saw okay but one of the highlights of last year was when he went on dave rubin's show don't know anything about this. And um, <laughs> it was quite a short interview, I think. I think it was live, though. Obviously, don't go and watch Dave Rubin. <laughs> watch any other clip of it. Watch Michael Brooks's clip of it. Okay. Um, and he, he, midway through, takes this phone call from his son live <laughs> and then spends about 45 minutes talking about the most recent baseball trades that have happened. That's like awesome. Kind of baseball I'll have you watch that. Cool. Kind of thing. Um, so yeah, take and it's it. It's hard not to read it as um, uh, Larry King being so bored by that's awesome. Dave Rubin's presence that he uh, he, uh, he it, this sort of uh, deliberate slight against him. How cool! So yeah, as a as a as a sort of tribute to Larry King, our person. man Larry King. I will say, never really cared about Larry King or his show or anything like that, but he was at so many Dodger games and he sat right behind home plate. So at every broadcast you could see him and he's like throughout like kind of my childhood, he went from being this like kind of older guy to like by the end of his life, just being he's this always like shriveled. Like yeah. He's always yeah, looked true. Ancient. But like you could read, cause like his posture changed. So he was just eventually this shriveled man. It was basically just an enormous Dodger hat and like <laughs> a shriveled man underneath it. Um, but that's my experience with Larry nice. King. Not much. Nice. Yeah. I mean, up- he, he, he might, he might've been a terrible person. Maybe. So, sue me, but I, I like him. I like <laughs> sue him. me. Yeah. You bring up Dave Rubin and you bring up, um, by proxy of that, the IDW and Michael Brooks. Um, I never had much exposure to Michael Brooks, but I read this thing that he wrote all about. Is it the IDW? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, I mean, he wrote a book called um, Against the Web. That's what I read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. And then three days later, he died. And I, I was know, like, I, like... I knew that guy. Yeah, I, 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 I like... I've never had anybody close to me die, mm. but by virtue of like all of the parasocial relationships we all yeah, exist yeah, in, yeah. particularly in that took over twenty twenty to some extent, yeah. like it was basically the closest that I ever got to like somebody I was I felt actually close to dying. I was mm. lit, I was really stricken by really, it. Um, not like sure, anyway, yeah, sure, but sure. like more so than I ever had been by anybody else. Like it was a real, yeah. real shock, a yeah. real, real shock. Um, mm. Yeah, go go watch his show and w- look at any tributes that have been like paid to him, kind of thing. Because like, and it's, it's, there's somebody who um, incredibly committed to stories of like mm. socialism 
in the third world sure. um, and really sort of centered those kind of narratives and histories mm. um, in a way that few other people do um, so yeah somebody who to be to be commended mm. for sure always yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not to go off on another tangent but you brought that up uh, someone close to you dying like that Yesterday, I believe, was the one-year anniversary of Kobe's death, and that was, I was pulling a pint at the pub I used to work at, and some chavvy British dude was like, oh, Kobe Bryant's just on an helicopter crash, and that was, that was, like, the hardest I've ever been hit, mm -hmm. by far, by mm -hmm. a celebrity death. Mm -hmm. That was, like, someone who I just grew up watching every single night and was my hero, and I'd never, I obviously never thought that he would die, never thought that he would die in such a brutal way with mm -hmm. his daughter, it was so sad, um, yeah, very strange. You bring up parasocial relations, and it's like, I went home that night and cried. It was mm. like, why am I crying? I don't mm. remember Kobe, but it was like, damn. He was like, I felt like I knew him personally. Yeah. Very weird. Weird times. Yeah. Parasocial relationships. <laughs> We're making them right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're literally creating them. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Except for us, we are actually your best friends. <laughs> um, I thought that's what you were implying. <laughs> implying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I end day. We We've did done it. it. We've done it. Nice. Hopefully, we'll be back to this story and some of the characters eventually, sometime down the line. But for now, we say adieu to our fair Chilean and British friends. Yes. And adieu to you, dear listener. Oh my God, damn! What an oh, that's a little <laughs> um, This has been auxiliary statement. My name is Jack. <laughs> And I am Dan. <laughs> Thank you to our new listeners. That looks confused you. <laughs>music you heard this episode was music to kill bad people too by king gizzard and the lizard wizard if you like this song you can check it out and much much more on their band camp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com be sure and follow us up on instagram twitter and facebook and if you like what you heard be sure and tune in next week for some more comedy discussion till next time